Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is July 27th, 2017, and my guest is Benedict Evans, partner at the venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz. He writes about and discusses strategic and operating issues around consumer technology, ecosystems, and mobile platforms on his blog and on Twitter. Benedict, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you. Today we're going to we're going to be talking about the future of the car, uh, based on a very provocative and lengthy blog post that you wrote on the rise of of two things that appear to be uh, transformative for that industry, which are the electric car and the driverless car. And what I loved about the post, it was a beautiful example of one extremely important aspect of what I call the economic way of thinking and that I associate with George Stigler and Thomas Sowell, and that is, and then what? That is, something gets put in motion, something happens, something changes – And a lot of people think, well, that's the end of that. And what a good economist does and what you did in this blog post is start thinking about what are going to be the implications for a much wider range of stuff, uh, in particular about the consequences of more electric cars or more driverless cars, what you call uh, second and third order effects. So I want to get started with electric cars. Uh, How might they change things? Well – I think there's sort of there's two sets of things to think about here. The first is that an electric car doesn't so much get rid of the gas tank as kind of rip out the spine of the car. So it's not that you get rid of the gas tank and replace it with batteries. It's you get rid of the internal combustion engine and all of that associated systems, and you get rid of the transmission system and the gearbox, or most of the transmission system. So you probably have between five and ten times fewer moving cars. And that obviously has an awful lot of consequences inside the car industry, which are kind of the first order effects. Um, it has fairly obvious effects on the kind of the supply chain and also on things like um, companies making machine tools, which is a big part of, of the German industry. Um, but then the sort of stuff companies, around that. I'm sorry, companies making what? Machine tools. Oh, machine tools. Sure, that work on the cars, yeah. Yeah, like the people who make all the stuff, or the, the machine tools that make all those moving parts inside the gearbox um, have a problem. Um, but then you sort of start, start thinking, well, what about things like gas stations? So there's 150,000 odd gas stations in the USA. Um, gas is sold at almost no margin. They make their money from everything else. So it basically means salt, sugar, and nicotine um, in kind of shiny plastic packaging. And some portion of that is an impulse purchase. Um, and if you're never going to a gas station again, which basically you, you'll only go there if you want the salt, sugar, or nicotine, you won't go there, go there for gas anymore. Um, so what happens to sales of those? Something over half of sales of tobacco in the USA um, are sold in gas stations. Some portion of that is an impulse purchase. There's various sort of suggest studies around what pricing changes and what availability and packaging changes due to tobacco consumption. So um, there's a, I thought that was kind of an interesting consequence. Um, there's another, um, perhaps back more directly related to cars, around um, repair. So um, as far as I can make out, something around half of um, repair maintenance expenditure in the USA is on the stuff that's directly related to the internal combustion engine, like the oil change and the transmission and everything else. The rest is like, you know, you need tires or bodywork or the HVAC brakes or something. So there's other stuff that will be the same. But um, again, you go, you will have many fewer moving parts. You will have many fewer failures. You won't need an oil change because there's no oil. You're, the, the radiator fan belt won't fail because there's no radiator. Um, so you get a radical simplification in the mechanical mechanics of the car, and therefore a lot of the maintenance expenditure goes away. And, of course, that is actually the economic support for a lot of the dealer network as well. Um, that's where they make the money. So you've got these kind of rippling out effects around the stuff that's sort of the support infrastructure around the, the gasoline car, um, which will go away. Um, you know, the, the adoption of electric cars is really a question of when rather than if. It's a function of battery pricing, and battery pricing is kind of a function of scale. So there's a circularity there, or virtuous circle. Um, we are now at the point that we have expensive, uneconomic electric cars. We will get to the point in the next five or ten years that electric cars become cost competitive with gasoline, and how, then it's just a question of time uh, how, before the whole base recycle cycles out. How confident are you of that, that it's a five- to ten-year process? 
Oh, I mean, oh, well, so, so there's two processes here. So there is how long does it take to get to the point that um, an ordinary boring car is cheaper to buy as an electric car, is cheaper to buy an ordinary boring electric car than to buy an ordinary boring gasoline car? Um, so that's how long that, and that's a question of battery pricing, really. How long does it, and, and scale. Then how long does it take before all new cars on the market are electric? How long does it take before all the old cars cycle out of the system? And that kind of depends on public policy because it depends on what kind of incentives you put in, the government puts in place to do that. Um, but that feels like a, you know, 20, 30, 40 year process depending on how aggressive you are on, you know, going from the $50,000 electric car to the $10,000 or the $20,000 electric car and how, what you think the lifespan of existing vehicles is and so on. So it's not something, it's not like it won't all be done in five to 10 years. It's more like it will really start, get started in five to 10 years. I guess, um, is there any issue? There are some things that are simpler about an electric car, which means that there won't be the repairs that are necessary for an internal combustion engine. Are there some things that are more, complicated in an electric car well there's more software um so and then and by extension there's more computing um but that's kind of solid state it's not moving parts so um you know there's a different cost structure to a move it to a to an electric car and so if you look at um, um i think ubs did a, a teardown of a chevy volt versus a kind of a, a normal gasoline car and you know the um, the propulsion part is a lot cheaper. The electric motors and the battery cost less than having an internal combustion, complete internal combustion engine, plus the cost of the gasoline. But then you've got the 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 the, the, the electronics in there at a significant amount of cost. Um, but that's kind of a transitional issue. You know that will that will shrink down over time. Your point about uh, the margins of of dealerships, I. I have heard that before, that they don't make much money on the cars, and they make increasingly less as information becomes more widely available and people shop more wisely. And the Internet's really, I think, brought those margins down dramatically. Um, and so the, the claim is then that they make their money on the repairs. Of course, if the repairs go away, it's possible that the price of cars will be higher, that those margins will have to adjust to uh, make that worthwhile if there are still places that people show up to buy cars at. Yeah, I mean, it depends what the purchasing model looks like, doesn't it? I mean, obviously, Tesla is trying to go direct. It's not clear that everyone will be able to go direct. Right. Um, now, of course, there's a, there's a, now there's another effect which comes when one comes on to autonomy, um, which is that there will, if there are fewer accidents, then again, there will be there will be much less repair work as well. Yeah, um, for sure. So, and that doesn't need full autonomy. We can maybe go on to talk about, you know, different kinds of autonomy. But, you know, the Holy Grail is the car that doesn't have a steering wheel or the truck that doesn't have a human cabin. But you don't need to get that far before you start reducing the accident rate really significantly. And also, you don't have to have very many vehicles that never crash into anything before the accident rate starts going down. Yeah, we're going to, we will get to that. I'm going to stick for, for a moment, though, to the electric cars. What do you see? And you speculate a little bit in the piece on this, but what do you see as the model for how people are going to be charging the cars? Obviously, one of the challenges, at least right now, is the charging takes place over time. So you're not going to show up at a gas station with that impulse purchase opportunity to gas to charge up your car. You're going to have to plug it in somewhere for a relatively longer period of time. Is that going to change, do you think? And how might people um, charge their cars in a world where, where – Electric cars are, are more common. So there's no question there's a problem here no, or a challenge, depending on how, to move, whether, how, how you want to talk about it. Um, and yes, you don't charge quickly, and we're not on a, there's not a kind of an imminent timeline to being able to fully charge your vehicle in five minutes the way you do with, you know, with, with, with gasoline. Um, so there's a bunch of options. One is that you charge at work, you have charging stations in car parks, you have charging stations in supermarkets. Um, how far you scale that is a challenge. Um, there's, this is actually, I think this really becomes a, an urban density question because if you live in, if you have somewhere where you have your own driveway or you have your own garage, then there's just, you've just, well, you've just got to pay somebody a couple of hundred dollars to put a charging point in your home. Um, where I used to live in London, I didn't own a car. If I had owned a car, I don't think I would ever have parked it in front of my front door. It would have been somewhere within five minutes' walk if I could find a space. And even if it was parked in front of my front door, it would be parked on a street across a sidewalk, um, you know, 500 yards from a pub, 
where there might be people kind of walking past and I kind of might kind of collect drunks on the sidewalk if I had a power cable strung out of my front door into my car. So, um, you know, yes, there's real practical questions around what charging looks like. Um, related, frankly, to the real practical questions around what fueling looked like 100 years ago. Yeah, I guess, I guess uh, what, I, what we want is the same thing I have on a trip that I use when my, I worry about my iPhone not lasting an entire day. I you carry a small battery that I can recharge it with in the middle of the day if I need to. It's hard to imagine that will happen for a car. Uh, well, it do, it, we do actually have that as a, a tra- traditional sense at the moment. So um, you have cars that have a gasoline range extender. So like the BMW i3, um, it does as it might be 100 miles, but then there's a, you can get an option to have a gasoline pack that will give it another 75 or something. I forget what the number is. So there are all sorts of kind of transitional solutions to this. Um, but I mean, I just I kind of have in my mind kind of images of people doing kind of long distance endurance rallies in automobiles before the First World War, and the photographs of these cars—they've all got bundles of like three dozen tires strapped to the side of each each side of the vehicle, because <laughs> <laughs> of course the tires didn't allow tires were not very good then. Right. So you know these kind of, these things get solved. There's, it's a thing to solve, but it will get solved. Okay, so it could be like the Kindle. Uh, instead of going for 300 miles, it'll go for 3,000, and I'll only need to charge it once every three or four months. Uh, well, I think that would be that, that, that. I don't think we're any close to a battery technology that would do that unless you're thinking about resurrecting nuclear. Um, but um, I mean, there's also a psychological issue here. So um, you also have to ask well, yes, your car could drive maybe two or 300 miles between being fueled, um, but how often do you actually need to drive 300 miles? You know, what is your actual average daily or average, or even your average weekly consumption? And you know, back to my example, if I did, while well, still living in Kentish Town with a car, I would never drive. I might drive three hundred miles once a year. Right. So, um, what happened with phones is that you went from having to charge once a week to having to charge once a day, and as long as you can charge it overnight, you're okay. If, it, if it's more, than, if it's more than overnight, then that becomes a problem. And but it's also. It's just, and it's also your point, though, about where that charging station would be. If, if it was, if it's once a month, you wouldn't mind driving across town to a charging station, and it would charge it yeah. in ten no, I minutes. Don't, don't, I, I don't think we have anything in sight that would get us to charging once a month. I'm, I'm more kind of thinking of the other end that with phones went from charging for once a week to, and to charging once a day, but actually that turned out to be okay most of the time. And the same thing for cars. Um, if it can't go for 300 miles, it can only go for 100 miles without being recharged slash refueled. Well, maybe that's actually okay for most people. You know, your, your gasoline car can go for three or 400 miles on a full tank, but actually you never do that or very, very rarely do that. So maybe you'd be okay with a vehicle that actually only does 100 miles on a charge because actually you'd never, you'd never go more than 100 miles. Yeah, I'm thinking though about your urban density problem now. If I don't have a driveway... Uh, the once a day problem might be a might be a barrier. It is, but uh, uh, kind of back to my point. So imagine a so it's a phone that's a once a day. If you have a car that can only go a hundred miles on a charge, but actually you only drive fifty miles a week, then charging it once a it's week true. is kind of okay. Good point. And that's particularly and that's going to correlate with people in a high density area. Yeah. Where if you live out in the boonies, yes, you might drive. 50, 100 miles a day, but you're going to have a driveway. Yep. I like the point. There's, there's a bunch of variables here. Yeah, yeah. What's, what's the Elon Musk vision of the battery in my house that you allude to in that piece? Um, what, do, what do you think he has in mind? So, well, so there's two answers to that. One is Elon Musk wants to do anything he can to get battery volumes up in order to get battery prices down. And so anything way, way he can think of to get people to buy more batteries um, is good. Um, and that applies both to going from a low-volume car to a high-volume car to talking about trucks, potentially, but also to trying to sell you another battery. Um, and frankly, the solar thing applies to that as well. You know, why buy a battery? Well, if you why buy, the, the, having solar panels gives you an incentive to buy a battery in the same way. Um, so that's a large part of the story of his solar company. Um, so that's just kind of a scaling point. I think there's kind of a more, slightly more interesting conversation longer term when you think about what charging infrastructure looks like. So, you know, we talked about charging these cars. 
um, you have to think about, well, what does that do to like power generation requirements and also the local power distribution grid? Yeah, that's my that's my favorite example because as I like to point out, a Prius is really a coal-powered car in some dimension in many parts of the United States, except for the fact that if you charge it at night, you can use excess capacity and you're not really increasing the amount of uh, coal of coal-powered electricity generation. But as it gets – as more and more people adopt cars that are electric, that won't work. Yeah, well, it depends where you are. So um, if you're in France, it's a nuclear-powered car. Um, so, uh, 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 yeah, there's, clearly, there's a question around excess capacity, around the, what, what the loading of the power generation system looks like and when you're charging it. So if you're charging it overnight, for example – um, that also is kind of comes to the point of the battery because the battery can draw the excess power and then give it to your car when you need it. Um, and indeed, the battery can also store solar if you've got solar on your roof. So the battery is kind of an intermediate buffer for that. Um, I mean, there are also kind of actual like power company questions around, well, what does it actually mean if half the cars in our neighborhood, are suddenly, half the houses in this neighborhood are suddenly charging an, an electric pickup every night? What does that mean to the, how many substations we have? And what does the actual total load look like in that street all of a sudden? Um, so yeah, that's just kind of a transitional point. Um, there's a bunch of analysis that's been done on, you know, what loading would look like, when people would be using it, what the impact would be. And it kind of depends when and where you think people charge um, and what time. Of course, that's kind of the crucial point. But also, what does the power infrastructure even look like in that country? And this is my point about France. Well, it depends. Um, and that's kind of the renewable thing as well. If you've got a whole bunch of solar in your power system, um, well, that's not necessarily much good if people are charging overnight unless those people have batteries. Yeah, let's go back to this question of of um, relentlessness of this process and the likelihood that we're going to move toward this world away from the internal combustion engine. Right now, electric cars are subsidized by the government. Um, I'm against that, but that's neither here nor there. But right well, now – So are so gasoline cars. Um, well, they're all – in which dimension? And cars. In which dimension are gasoline cars subsidized? Well, it, depend, it depends where you are. Um, but, you know, I, 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 I don't want to dig into that. I mean, it's just you – know, I think that's kind of a short-term question. Well, I mean, uh, pe- there are certain things you – know, I, I always think it's funny when people say we should have a carbon tax. and It might be a good idea, uh, but we have a carbon tax. You could argue it's too low. Uh, we tax gasoline quite a bit, and you point out, I thought, also cleverly in your piece that – one of the impacts of this is going to reduce revenue um, for highway building and other sort of things that people use with gasoline uh, taxes. But the point is, is that right now there's a pretty heavy subsidy to the purchase of an electric car. Uh, if that went away, do you think that the uh, technology improvements in battery pricing would sufficiently – uh, that, that we might see going forward are going to be sufficient to make a drive a, an electric car uh, competitive with an internal combustion car in, in the next five to ten years. No question. Um, you can argue about the timing, um, but the kind of the cost track of lithium ion batteries is 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 pretty clear. Um, you know, quite when it reaches quite what price in order to be cost competitive with gasoline is still kind of a matter of opinion. There's a spread of estimates. Um, and clearly, having a subsidy on top of the purchase price of the car helps that. Um, but the underlying trend is the same. So that's going to be very interesting. And, and of course, that's going to have – if that really happens, uh, the geopolitical Im- impact is going to be quite dramatic. Um, large parts of the world, we've been mainly focused on – I think most of us in this conversation, you and me, the two of us. I've been thinking about the United States and the drivers and gas stations in the United States, but of course, the nations that that use um, that supply the oil to the world uh, would would have a very different uh, future in a world where where uh, the internal combustion engine uh, was not relevant. And one would expect then uh, to play economist. Uh, one would expect that that their behavior would change dramatically if they thought this was imminent. So maybe they don't think – it doesn't seem to be changing. It is – price of gasoline is lower right now than it's been in a while. But uh, you'd expect it to be maybe lower still because just to take the most obvious example, Saudi Arabia is sitting on enormous reserves of of um, 
of uh, crude oil still. And if it turns out that the internal combustion engine is not going to be a viable uh, market product in the marketplace, uh, the value of that is going to be lower. Yeah, so there's a bunch of things to think about here. Um, the um, the portion of global oil production that goes to cars is something like 40%, I believe, from memory. Um, now, removing that demand over a period of anything between 20 and 40 years, maybe longer, um, and of course, removing it where, um, you know, it will be a different rate in different countries. So it's a relatively, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. Um, and then there are other uses for that um, production as well. So, you know, it's not like there's going to be a guillotine. Um, there's also, um, I mean, you know, to, to really play economist, of course, if you were to look at Venezuela, you would argue, well, what good has oil been? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, you so, can, you can mess it up. You can have something valuable and not use it wisely. Or, 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 well, I mean, you know, there's a the whole cost disease problem that, you know, just having that, ass, you know, the, 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 um, the curse of having assets, uh, of, of having um, natural resources. So you can certainly make an argument that, you know, that actually the, um, you know, there may be it might do more harm to um, people selling in luxury apartments in New York City than it might do to many of the people in those countries themselves. Um, it's a great so that's, point. You know that that's an economic argument. No, it's a great point. And a development argument. It's not a it's not it's not a technology argument. Um, I mean, I think there's another you know just a, a, on that point. It's an it's just sort of worth looking at the other side that. Um, Many of the people, particularly you know, not so much um, Saudi, but if you look at, for example, Nigeria, um, people, the, the, the relevant petrochemical for a lot of people in Nigeria isn't gasoline, it's kerosene for lighting. Mm -hmm. And so there, there is a solar story um, and sort of the growth of solar in emerging markets as cheap, um, healthy energy because, you know, you're sitting in a hut burning um, animal dung or burning kerosene. Um, and that's how your kids are doing their homework. Um, well, now you have a solar panel um, with an LED light. And so that's a way in which um, petrochemicals uh, affect people's lives and are going to be changed by, in fact, some of the same technologies. Um, that's got nothing to do with cars. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's move on to driverless cars, which uh, I, I have to confess I'm somewhat uh, endlessly fascinated by that, the possibility of it and, and the implications. And I, one of the things I really liked about your article is that I think most people have misunderstood the full scope of um, of the implications of, of driverless cars. Uh, they kind of – they get the idea that there are going to be fewer accidents. They get the idea that there might be fewer people working as taxi drivers, Uber drivers, or truck drivers. And then they have some idea about uh, maybe people won't be buying as many cars, which I think is, um, is much more complicated. But you spin out quite a few uh, – more interesting implications than those simple ones, and I and I think and some of those implications reminded me of some ideas that I think uh, that people misunderstand, which we'll, we'll get to, not just don't don't notice, but I think get it wrong. Uh, but I want to start in talking about driverless cars with the uh, different levels of autonomy that you uh, alluded to earlier and that you mentioned in the okay. in the piece. So that's a good way to frame this. So the industry, the car industry talks about five levels of autonomy. So level one to level five or L1 to L5. Um, level one is the mechanical cruise control that came in in the late 50s and early 60s. So you put a switch on, a, on, your, on a stick and the car will go at 69 miles an hour right into the truck in front of you. Um, so it's just a purely mechanical thing. Level two is you have a little bit of radar to that and maybe um, or image sensor to that. And so you will slow down if the vehicle in front slows down and you will maybe give a warning if you start straying out of your lane, purely based on looking at the white stripes on the road. Um, this is also basically mechanistic. And it's being done in software, but there's no intelligence to it. Um, this is what you get if you buy a high-end German car or if you buy a Tesla. Um, and, of course, um, Tesla, until very recently, was buying exactly the same technology off the shelf of an Israeli company called Mobileye that BMW and Mercedes were buying. Um, and, the, and Tesla was just calling it autopilot, but it was the same thing. Um, and, yeah, that will drive straight into the back of the truck in front of you slightly less often, but it's not in any sense intelligent. That's level two. Level three, um, it actually has some sense of its surroundings, um, it can look around itself. It has a sort of 360-degree awareness of a very basic kind. And you can give it a direction and it'll take you there. 
Um, but you need to be sitting in the, in the driver's seat with your hands about an inch away from the steering wheel at all times. Because at any point it might get something wrong or it might just stop and say, I don't know what to do now. Um, level four, you can read a book. It, it might stop and say, I don't know what to do, but it almost certainly won't. Um, level five is just a question of level four, but with more nines of reliability. So level five is the point that you're confident you can take the steering wheel out of the vehicle um, and that you can potentially drive, for example, design a commercial vehicle without a human cabin at all. Now, I think the interesting thing as you move along that progression is like level two, level three is basically a safer car, but it's still a car. Um, level four, level five, you use the term self-driving cars. I prefer the term autonomous. And the reason I don't like the term self-driving car is that's very like saying horseless carriage. That you remove the horse from the carriage. And if you look at kind of early automobile, early, 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 um, vehicles from the early 20th century, they've taken the horse off, but it's still a carriage. Yep. Um, and in the same way, you remove the person, but it's still a, it's still a car. Um, well, that's not how it works. And, you know, removing the gas tank, just as, removing the ga as, just as electric isn't about removing the gas tank, autonomy is not actually about the car driving itself. It's about the, you getting rid of the person, and it's about changing everything else about that vehicle and everything else around the city around it in much the same way that removing the horse wasn't just about removing the horse. It changed everything else about vehicles and everything else about cities. So let's start with the question of um, you want to speculate just for fun uh, how far away level four and five might be. Um, so opinion varies on this. The most optimistic people will say we'll have sort of level four slash level five in five years. Um the consensus probably edges more towards 10 years. Um, the variability within, and that's for the first vehicle. Then just as for electric, then you have a whole transition question of, well, how long does it take to go from the first one to all vehicles and being all new vehicles? And then how long does it take to all vehicles in, a, in an area um, or in a city? And do you have like segregated lanes or park and ride? And what incentives do you have and so on? But five to 10 years for the first one. Um, the variability in that is really about um, like the last couple of percent of difficulty. So, if you had a city where there, if you had a like a, a, a if you have a place somewhere where there are no pedestrians and no human drivers, an automatic car is really easy. Um, the hard part is accounting for what other people are going to do, accounting for pedestrians, accounting for the child that might run out from behind the um, yep. the parked car. Um, and so, like, we may well have, like, level four on highways quite soon. Having level five in Naples might be a bit more difficult. Right. Um, like, what exactly is that hand gesture telling you to go and do? Um, so there may be that, you know, there, there are situations and use cases and areas where it takes a lot longer for this really to work properly. Is it – do you think it's feasible in one of the glorious – prospects for this is um, zero accidents. Obviously, most, many accidents are caused by a human failure right now. Um, it's going to, there's going to be yeah, something. It's over 90%, well so, over 90%. And, and of course, an autonomous car is going to make a mistake now and then. It already has, and it, tragically, it's, it's killed some people. Well, that was an autonomous car. Oh, that was a... Um, <laughs> that was a Tesla. That was a two. <laughs> yes, that was a level two. So when we go to four or five, um, is is the only accident going to be the, the deer darting in the road that you mentioned in the piece? Or will there be the potential for um, – in other words, here, here's the thing. I mean I, when, when, when autonomous cars first got proposed and, and I see them driving around my neighborhood – I'm in Palo Alto for the summer, so I, I literally see them in front of my house just cruising around. Yeah, it was kind of amazing. It's like a dog on his hind legs. Amazing it's done at all. Um, is it really feasible that it'll be accident-free? Well, it depends what you mean by accident-free. Um, yes, there will be the deer that runs out, and there will be the tree that falls down. There will be the acts of God, so to speak, 
where um, it's not an error. Will there be errors? Realistically, perhaps. Um, will they kill people or will they be something else where the car just kind of stops? You know, the, the, the error I can ex expect to see more of is like two cars at a junction and each of them keeps waiting for the other one to go and neither of them go and they stay there all day. It's a Buridan's ass problem for you philosophers out there, but go ahead. No. Yeah, so I think that, that feels more probable to me than the vehicle that just kills, that's just starts killing people. Um, although, you know, you, you can't really talk in absolutes here. Um, on the other hand, 35,000 Americans were killed in road accidents last year, and we just kind of shrug that off as part of life. Um, so there's also kind of a, a degree of psychological acceptance and understanding of this yeah. here, I think. Um, I don't, you know, and the number of people, you know, how many people are killed by tobacco in the USA every year, and yet we don't ban tobacco. Yep. Tobacco killed, car accidents killed 35,000 people in the USA last year. Tobacco killed half a million. Tobacco is legal. So there's a real question of psychology and consumer consciousness and consumer, you know, how people think about this stuff yeah. within that. But yeah, I don't think there's no like, there's, okay, so put another way, there's certainly no theoretical barrier to getting to level four which is the accident-free place. The questions are around the level five, which is the, okay, so now you can have a vehicle that doesn't have a human driver. And that's the part that all the economics change and the cities change. Yeah, and it's more fun to talk about. So we're going we're gonna to talk about level five. But before we do, one more question. What's the hacking um, risk here? Uh, if, if we move to a level five, I'll make the segue here. If we move to the level five where... Uh, the cars are coordinated in a way so we could think about cars going 100, 120 miles an hour or faster in a chain, two feet apart, because uh, there's no risk of coordination among them that causes traffic or, or death. Um, what's going to be the potential, and I don't know how smart the grid is going to have to be versus the car itself, because there's certainly going to be some gains from going from it, cars being smart to the streets being smart. And if we go to that level, what's the hacking potential? Well, so first of all, I don't think there's a consensus that you would have smart a smart street, so to speak, as opposed to um, smart cars. Um, so there's, there's kind of two levels to this. So one level is um, in an on-demand world, um, you would absolutely have coordination of placement of vehicles around a city so as to optimize the efficiency of traffic so that there was always a vehicle. There was just the right number of vehicles to pick everybody up and no more in any given area um, and, you know, optimize routing of those vehicles. And you may well have optimized routing, uh, uh, optimizing, optimization of the routes that the vehicles take around the city so as to kind of make sure that you don't have one city there where every vehicle, deci every vehicle decides to go down the same road. Um, so at the moment, you, you drive around using Google Maps, you can clearly see, it, you know, there's five other people. You're going down this kind of random suburban side street, and you can see there's like five other cars who are following the same Google route. Um, so you expect to see coordination of that. You expect to see coordination of placement of cars within the city. Yep. Whether you would have coordination of vehicles on a one-to-one -one basis talking to each other to make sure they don't hit each other, I think that's a whole other question. And I think a lot of people would say, actually, no, you won't. The cars... You know, they may. The, it, it would be much more like the relation of you driving yourself versus the Google Map. So the car may be getting a, being being told what roads to go down, but it may be entirely autonomous as to how it goes down those roads and how it stops and accelerates. Um, their opinions vary on that. So some people think you would have everything kind of managed and done centrally, but I think most people think it would be the car itself that would be making that decision. Now, clearly, there's a threat of the car itself the cars themselves being hacked. You know, they are network-connected computers designed by human beings. And, you know, every time you make something idiot-proof, God creates a better idiot. So um, it's, you've got one can't guarantee that. Um, but at the same sense, I don't think one can just say, well, we won't do anything just in case something goes wrong. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I just wonder, you know, I think the... There's a temptation, I, I think, among technology people and to just sort of wave their hands and say, well, this problem will get solved because it's always been solved and we're just smart and we'll think about it and we'll work it out and we'll fix it. And then there's the similar uh, anti-technology people who say, well, then a bunch of evil people are going to mastermind all the cars crashing into each other at once. And neither of those is quite capturing what actually goes on in human innovation. Uh, I'm just – Curious about how worrisome you think that latter problem is. I know it's not the 
uh, the movie version where uh, an evil genius whispers the wrong word and all the cars hear it through their sensors and it and it ruins their computer systems and they all drive off off cliffs. But is there some in between scenario that's a little bit frightening to you? Um, so there's a whole other conversation around how like how the sort of computer security threat environment has changed, that it's no longer, you know, a teenager walks into your building with a, a virus on a floppy disk or, you know, somebody hacks in from outside. It's now 300 people in a building in China who uh, know what school your kid goes to and send your P- your executive assistant an email that looks like it comes from the, the head of the, 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 the... It looks like an invoice from the school or something. So, there's a, you know, that that's a kind of another question. So, yes, um, it's a concern. It's kind of like it's a problem to solve once we've worked out if we can ever make this work at all, though, I think. Say, so this say is that like again. A, well, it's a problem that we'll have to solve once yeah. we've made a car that can drive itself. If yeah. we can't make a car that can drive itself anyway, it's a mood. Um, we'll, kind of, we'll put the firewall on afterwards. So one of the things that, that people forget about uh, <laughs> is your point about the horseless carriage. There's going to be a very different uh, design of the physical car. It's not just not going to have a front seat. So talk about some of the changes, um, or everything will be the front seat, but there'll be no place for a, quote, driver. It might look like a, you know, I don't know, a circular lounge or a, a table with 10 seats around it. Who knows what it'll look like? It'll look more like a teacup in at Disney World uh, floating around. Uh, what what are some of the changes uh, you point out? The, uh, the, really ob- interesting and not so obvious fact that cars are heavy because for safety reasons. So what else might change? So there's a bunch of, of kind of basic assumptions that change. The first one is that the vehicle that have, is going to be in collisions. And obviously, um, again, there's the transitional period where you still have human-driven cars around, and then there's a period where everything is fully automatic and you can you, you're, more stuff changes. Um, but in a fully automatic world, there are no collisions. Therefore, there are no... Colli- there are no um, Safety cages, no crumple zones, no airbags, um, or maybe much reduced, or you design those with completely different thinking in mind. Um, and so that obviously changes the weight and the cost. It can also change what the physical design of the vehicle might look like. I mean, the design that we have now, where you've kind of got a slope at the front and a slope at the back and a trunk and so on, like, the doors can be in different places, you know, the windows can be in different places. Um, Obviously, you don't have a loads of great mechanical lump of an internal combustion engine there, which you can get rid of. I mean, this is the... Uh, Part of the, the point of looking at a Tesla is you wouldn't actually know it, it didn't have a gasoline engine inside it if you didn't know to, in advance. Um, you can design, uh, with both electric and sort of a zero accident world, you could design vehicles that look quite differently. Um, the second thing to think about, particularly if you think about on demand as well, um, is that you could design vehicles that would only go at 20 or 30 miles an hour. So today, any vehicle you design has to be able to go on the freeway because you might need to go on the freeway. Um, but in an on demand world, the system would know where you were going and if you weren't going on a freeway it wouldn't necessarily have to send a vehicle that was going to do that so you really could have you know pods quote unquote that aren't particularly streamlined because they're not going to get over 25 miles an hour and so you're talking now when you say on demand you mean like an uber type yes. uh, service without a driver yes. um so you're thinking about let's think about what this would be i'm going to go to the grocery the grocery is about three miles away so i don't want to walk um you're but presuming I'm, that you will ever go to the grocery yourself again, of course. Oh, that's true. Of course <laughs> not. A separate, that's a separate conversation. Oh, no good point. I forgot about that. <laughs> right, I'm just going to whistle. But that, I'm just, just going to whistle. But that, but that makes another point, which is how, what is it, how does this change thinking about delivery? Particularly if you're, in, again, if you're in the suburbs, you could very easily imagine a vehicle that kind of came and dropped a canister out on your front door when you were there that didn't even necessarily have a human being in the vehicle. Correct. Uh, yeah, it would pull up, and I would. It would. Op- it would be like an Amazon yeah. locker. I just go in and yeah, exactly. Take it out, or I say I don't want to be there though. That's that's a huge problem. I, it needs to eject it onto my front lawn, or a, it would probably need to stick its arm into a box that I had on my front lawn. Yeah, there's a bunch of other stuff that would need to change before you could go to like before you could do all of that. Those kinds of things. But you know, you just got to test the assumption that you're going to take yourself to the grocery store because, of course, that the driving is a cost of delivery in the other direction. So let's take. Um, I mean, the, the, I was going to say the embedded point within this, of course, in case it isn't clear, is that if you remove the human driver from a a vehicle, you take out at least three quarters of the cost. Yeah, it's huge. 
So an on-demand ride that costs 10 bucks today would cost two or three bucks. And if you remove the insurance, if you're in a fully autonomous world with no accidents, then the insurance goes down as well. So it goes from $10 to $2. Yeah. And so your calculation about whether you own a vehicle or whether you own one vehicle or two is going to change a great deal. And your calculation about where you might, I mean, going to the grocery store, uh, going to the grocery store, not, it's, 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 uh, to me, that's like a less interesting example. The example I really like is you're going to go out, to, you're thinking about going out to dinner in central, in Manhattan or central London on a night in November. And it's cold and dark and raining. And you live in the suburbs. So you can walk 10 minutes to the train station and then get a train for 20 minutes and then get the subway and you'll arrive at this restaurant an hour later. You could call for an existing car, like a taxi, and that will cost you $20 each way. Um, You could drive yourself and then you're going to spend 25 minutes looking for parking and pay for parking. And, of course, one of you can't drink um, because you've got to drive back. Um, and then you've got to walk back to where you park the car. Well, now an on-demand ride will get you there and back for $3 each way or $4 each way. So the whole way that you think about the city changes. Uh, I'm, we got started on this because you were talking – making the observation. It was very interesting – that's not in your piece about the fact that a car's design would be different if it never had to go above 30 miles an hour. And in that case, though, I probably want it to go a little faster. Yeah. In this case, you might be going faster, yes. Or you might, you know, the, the car might have a bar in it, you know. <laughs> of course, there'll be no such thing as drink driving either. Right. No, it would have a bar or a vending machine or a, who knows what, a, a TV. A it'll, have a, it'll have a mini bar and that'll be the expensive part of your trip. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I, you know, I'm thinking of more of um, a surround screen of, of say, the whole front half of the car, which would wrap around you, so that you could be immersed in uh, YouTube for the 20 minute ride, uh, rather than talking to anybody or thinking an independent thought. It's a little bit of a frightening world, but it, I think it's coming. Right, right now we drive and our mind wanders, which is an amazing thing. You can drive pretty well when your mind's not looking at the street, really. Your brain is doing about a thousand other things. Now you're going to be able to decide what your brain does in those in those times. You're not just going to be on your cell phone, because I assume driverless autonomous cars without drive without uh, autonomous on demand cars are going to have uh, entertainment options. I assume there'll be some competition and uh, some of them will have a person. So I I'd, I'd actually disagree with that. Okay. Um, Fire away. So I certainly I've seen like people in the car industry sort of presuming that they're going to be able to sell Netflix subscriptions. My presumption is that it's your phone. And maybe the screen in the car connects to your phone and so your phone sends video to the car. So I it's like AirPlay, that. it's AirPlay or Chrome or music. So the car will have a screen and speakers, yes. But I don't think that that will be standalone. I think that will be part of your broader account. Like maybe you'll log into the phone. Maybe it'll be, if it's an Apple car, you know, you'll log into it and it'll have the same stuff that you have on your iPhone. Or maybe it's just a dumb, like, you know, clearly what's going to happen with TVs. The TV is going to be a dumb screen and the speakers will be dumb speakers and they'll just accept stuff from your phone. I, I think that's probably more the model. So in this world, so let me try a different version. I know you've written some interesting things about virtual reality and augmented reality. So suppose uh, instead of a car, I'm on like a, a Segway maybe, uh, some kind of little ti- – instead of being like a limo, I'm in the, on like a platform, uh, just a rolling platform that goes at various speeds. And I'm using my augmented virtual reality phone headset embedded chip to entertain myself on the way. The car itself isn't going to have much of anything. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, that would also be the case if it was a shared vehicle. Yeah. Um, and so this is, again, this is sort of another tangent, another interesting place to spiral off in. Um, right now, um, you've got this kind of binary distinction. I mean, sort of set trains aside as a separate conversation, but you have a bus and then you have a car, which is either your own or it's a taxi. And as opposed to a bus, um, which is this big, heavy thing that carries 50 people. And um, a four-seat vehicle that is completely automatically controlled. So, so one back. So I live in. I'm sort of caught speaking to you from Silicon Valley. Obviously, you're in Palo Alto as well. There's whole parts of the of the world where like the density of, of people means there's a lot of cars around, 
but the density also means that you can't support a bus network um, that runs on a fixed route at a fixed schedule, stopping at fixed points with a vehicle that's a certain size and that has a human driver. Now, one of the things that autonomy does is it sort of breaks down that binary distinction. So um, if I step out on the street and I press the Palo Alto Public Transit app button on my phone and say I need a ride, and a pod that's two blocks away and has two people in it already pulls up and I get in and I take the third seat and then it goes off and drops someone else there and then drops me where I want to go and picks up somebody else on the way. Well, is that a bus or a cab? Is that, I don't think that's a meaningful question. It's something else. But it is, is it public transit? Is it a cab? Well, it's changing what that conversation looks like. You're kind of unbundling the bus, but you're also in a sense sort of re-aggregating taxis. And so you're changing how you might think about how you might move around a neighborhood like that. Yeah. Um, because, you can it dy- because you can route it dynamically, because you don't have the cost of a driver. Do you think there'll be drivers, uh, not drivers, but uh, co-passengers for socializing? Do you think people will want to ride with someone who's not driving and just wants to chat them up? Well, it's just the joke that the lift line is the new Tinder. Um, so, yeah, maybe. Um, it seems like a li- it seems like your, your, your selections might be a little bit limited, um, yeah. a little bit too random. Yeah, it's true. Um, depends, you know, it depends what part, of the, what part of the country you're in, whether, you, whether that's going to work or not, I think. So you mentioned that there's not going to be any drunk driving. There might be a bar in the car. It could certainly get – you don't have to have a designated driver. Have we seen right now in places where Uber is – fairly friendly and and doing well. Do we notice that there's more drinking going on? I feel like there is, but I don't, there should be more drinking. Is Uber big enough and, you, and Lyft, are they ubiquitous enough that we can observe fewer accidents and more drinking? So short answer, yes. Um, I don't have it immediately to mind, but there's definitely been studies showing decliners in drink driving. Um, I think I think and I think actually there was a reverse in Austin when they um, shut down Uber and Lyft. Um, well, I know there's going to be more drunk. There's going to be less drunk driving. I wonder if there's more drinking overall. In other words, oh, you, and, you and I are going to go out and one of us is going to have to not drink. So we think eh, it's not so much fun. Maybe is it now the case that we can both since we can both drink that we go more often? Um, I think that's one of those like fifth order consequences. It's really hard to predict. Um, I mean, certainly something that I experienced because you know I was at university just before mobile phones happened, and they kind of happened as I was in my kind of late early as I was in my early twenties in London, and there was this sort of fundamental change that suddenly people stopped making plans. Because before mobile phones, if you were going to meet, you had to agree at like lunchtime where you were going to meet. Yeah. And we were all going to meet here at this time. And if you didn't get there, then that was it. You just didn't see your friends that night. And then mobile phones happen and suddenly people don't make plans and stuff just kind of spontaneously organizes as you drift through, you know, 10 blocks of the city. So I don't think anyone was sitting in 1995 and saying, gee, mobile phones will mean that people will go to, will go to five bars instead of one bar, <laughs> which, you know, which is kind of what happened. Yeah, um, I don't think you can predict those kinds of changes. Yeah, it's fascinating, actually. I didn't, I didn't think about that planning thing, although I still think um, it's interesting how social norms have to evolve at the same time. Uh, you know, we live in a world where everybody has their phone with them now, and most of us don't make phone calls. Uh, you know, it's a remarkable thing how little you use your phone to call somebody. Uh, use it to text, use it to email, use it to whatever else – whatever social media you use to interact with people, especially younger people. But I find it fascinating that this device we call a phone is so rarely used for calling. Well, do you, how, do you, how often do you dial it? I don't think I do it more than... I don't, well, you, well, you, have, you, ha, you haven't actually used a telephone dial in probably 20 years. Oh, for sure. But I was thinking... And, of, you, haven't, and you haven't hung up a phone in probably 40 years. Uh, for so sure. So these, these terms sort of linger on long after we've kind of forgotten what they actually mean. But the only phone calls that I make on my cell phone or 90 percent of them, maybe higher, are people who live way out of town. My parents, my siblings, uh, uh, my friends back in D.C. when I'm away for the summer, I, I might call them. But for the people I'm living around, I don't call them very often. I mainly text and say, see you soon or can you meet me here or – 
So I did a, um, I wrote another blog post um, looking at sort of the ways that we make like the wrong predictions about the future. <laughs> and um, one of the things that I put in this was a report from a firm called Telegeography, which is a telecoms consulting firm in 1990. And um, I'm just going to read you the opening paragraph. Um, the telephone, this is 1990. So we're just starting to get like ISDN, like digital connections. Very few people have a PC. Um, the telephone is going through a metamorphosis. The black Bakelite chrysalis is becoming an electronic butterfly. But what kind of butterfly? Could it be that the fax has given us a glimpse of what lies ahead? Just over the world, there may be a world where millions of people routinely pass photos, drawings, workstation displays, and electronic documents through cross-border telecom circuits. Circuits. And so this then report then goes on to talk about how the government treaties that regulate how phone companies pay each other for cross-border traffic um, will have, will, might be, have to be reworked because people will be making many, many, many more international circuit switched phone calls hmm. to exchange information with each other hmm. using maybe color faxes or faxes that don't print out but just have screens. Oh. But you'll still be like directly dialing an actual telephone number to somebody in Japan to see what's on their computer. And so you can kind of, this is always like the problem with predictions about the future. You make linear predictions. So you look at the thing that you're going to have now and you extrapolate it into the future without realizing that the kind of the entire character of it is going to change into something else. So let's talk a few about a few more examples of that in the driver, the autonomous car world, because they're some of the more exciting ones. Uh, one of the things, one of the more, there are two things that I think about, and one of them I didn't think about correctly, and your piece reminded me to get it right, which is, you know, you might not, if if you don't buy a car as a consumer, and you rely on on-demand autonomous cars, then you don't need a garage, uh, which is good because in Palo Alto nobody puts a car in a garage. They use it as storage. Uh, but you don't need a garage for storing your car. You don't need a driveway. Roads don't have to be as wide because you don't have to worry as much about human error going outside the lane. And so cities could be very different. And in particular, one thing you focused on is parking. Uh, parking is a, becomes a very different thing. But one thing you didn't mention much and you alluded to it earlier in our conversation is where the – Driverless cars, the autonomous on-demand cars are going to be hanging out uh, while I'm eating dinner or wandering to where to go see a friend or whatever it is. And I think in most people's minds, they're just wandering around like like Uber drivers do now. But they probably no, wouldn't they'll be just – They'll be plotting. Yeah, they wouldn't be wandering around. That would be not the right thing that's probably going to happen. The other thing I just wanted to mention, because I, I think I've gotten this wrong before, and I, this is the one thing I've, I've thought about I think that's right now, is a lot of people, I think, misunderstand this this thing that right now your car is sitting in your driveway doing nothing. And with, with autonomous on-demand cars, it's going to be in use all the time. But that just means it's going to wear out sooner. It's really your driveway that's wasted, not the car when it's sitting there. When the car is sitting there, it's it's you know it's in the elements. It can get rained on and – it can rust a little bit. Another thing, and it's not always good for it to not be used for a while. But the real effectiveness of the of this issue is going to be on the roads and the driveways, not so much the cars. They're going to need more maintenance. They're even if they're electric, they're going to need more. The tires are going to wear out sooner if they're used twenty four seven or close to twenty four seven. And where are they going to hang out? That's that's the other thing I'm thinking about. So I think this. Well, this this. So there's a bunch of things to think about here. One of them is like, certainly, even if it's your own vehicle that isn't on demand, it doesn't need to wait for you in walking distance. So particularly in city centers, you can rethink um, most obviously on street parking. And so if you look at like any New York or any kind of European city, the center of the cities, you've got cars parked down both sides of the road and that like halves the width of the road. Um, so you don't need on street parking. Um, requirements for building parking space in new buildings in high air, high value real estate areas. Again, you don't need to give up six floors of Park Avenue for parking. Um, something like twenty five percent of the surface area of LA County is parking. Um, so there's a real estate question here. First of all, like the parking can move. Um, there is a 
an issue there that if your Paco, your car isn't parked, but it goes away and then it comes back. So that's more traffic. But on the other hand, you don't spend 25 minutes driving around and around looking for a parking space. So that's less traffic. And the roads are twice as wide because you don't have people parked down both sides of the road. So, you know, you get kind of you get pros and cons here. Yeah, sidewalks are going to be a lot more interesting because they're going to be a lot wider, potentially. Yeah, well, they could be, yes. Or they could actually be an extra lane, depending on, on, on where you are. Um, there's a there's a there's a utilization question is slightly is kind of interesting, which is like like the, the, it feels like if, to me it feels a little bit crude to say like your car isn't used ninety three percent of the time because well you know eight hours of that is in the middle of the night when no one else is going to want a car either. Yeah. Sure. And there's a whole bunch of that, like, you know, how many people actually want to be driving around at three o'clock in the afternoon on a, week, on a Thursday? So I, it's a bit problematic to look at the total, you know, mo- actually most, most cars are used, uh, the, the, yes, they're only used 7% of the day, but it's all the same 7%. And actually, unless, like, people stop working or work at completely different times, that's not going to change. Yep. So I think it's a little bit tricky to, to, to talk about utilization rates overall. Um, and, of course, you see this now that Uber and Lyft, one of the, they actually have to get more drivers because, uh, clearly, there aren't actually lots of unused cars lying around that are available. Um, I think the um, there's a there's a kind of the broader kind of parking question around, like, okay, you... So your house has a park, has a parking space and a garage. Okay, you won't build a house with a garage. Um, in fact, no no houses in the UK have been built with garages because, of course, the weather doesn't require it. Um, there was a period when you actually needed to put your car indoors in the British weather, and now you don't. American weather, you still need to put your car indoors um, to get the weather's worse. Um, but where do they go? Well, it depends. The point is they don't have to go within walking distance of where you are now. So you can optimize it in ways that you can't optimize it now. Um, the answer might be much the same place sometimes. Yeah. Um, you know, what, you know, Walmart, presuming there is still a Walmart, a Walmart out, out in the suburbs, if people are still going there themselves, well, the car is probably just going to sit and stop, get a stop in the parking lot. That's probably the best place for it. Um, but in central Manhattan or, you know, the expensive part of L.A. or something, then you might have a very different calculation. Um, so, you know, it's complicated. I guess the interesting question is, how many do you need? And I and I think you do need quite a bit fewer, except for the fact that delivery and the fact that the price of an on-demand ride might be very low, as you suggested earlier. You might pe- see people going out a lot more because it's going to be so cheap. Yeah, you might. Well, so again, um, you might go out a lot more on demand. You might have one car instead of two. Um, you might have a car for the weekends, but in the weekday, you might previously have driven to work, but now you go to work on a bus, and but because the bus takes half as long because there's no congestion. Yep. Or maybe you previously, you, or maybe you're in, as I mentioned earlier, you're in like a four-person bus. Like if you live in Palo Alto, previously you had to drive to work because there was no other way to get to work. Well, now you might summon on-demand ride that might be carrying three other people. So maybe that's four cars that have become one car or... So there's, there'll be an awful lot of different variables in quite what this does to traffic, quite what it does to vehicle utilization, quite what it does to real estate. I just want to say we're recording this in 2017, and it, it, it of course, is immortal. Uh, in 2027 and 2037 and 2047, people will, of course, be able to listen to old Econ Talk episodes, uh, maybe just by saying, um, OK, Google, Benedict Evans – Econ Talk 2017, and then they're going to look back on this and say, what a genius he was. Or are they going to say, boy, how clueless they were back in 2017. They didn't have well, any it, idea. It won't even be that because it will be, find me a podcast with somebody with a British accent in 2017 talking about autonomous cars and getting it wrong because by 2040 <laughs> – You'll be able to do that. That's true. <laughs> maybe not quite. Maybe not quite that extent. But you will certainly be able to say, you know, you, you know, this is a whole other conversation around machine learning. But um, audio and video will be indexed in the way the text is indexed now, as a result of machine learning, and it's machine learning that is also enabling autonomous cars. Um, so you will be able to say, you know, show me all the car chase, show me a cool car chase on YouTube, and it won't be because somebody typed in this is a cool car, this is a car chase. It will be because YouTube has indexed the video and it knows it's a car chase. Yeah, I've been as a podcaster. I'm longing for that. Um, it's right now one of the few frustrations about podcasting is the fact that they're hard to search. We have a 
semi-transcript, we call it highlights, that allows people to go back and find old points and old episodes. But I can't tell you how many times listeners have said to me, I can't find your interview with so-and-so. And I always say, well, that's because I've never interviewed him. <laughs> go, yeah, you know, just, uh, on to the point, just uh, expanding a little bit on what I, what I was just saying, of course, there won't be any car chances. So oh, think about how true. many movies from the past don't work now because of mobile phones. Yeah. Well, there won't be any car chases. So you couldn't make heat again, for example. Or the French, or the French connection. The best. Or the French connection. Uh, all sorts of, you know, the world, the world changes. You know, there was a time when you, a movie plot point was that the car broke down. But cars don't break down. There was a time when the movie plot point was you couldn't reach somebody. Well, you can always reach people. So movies will change. For sure. The question is, are people going to enjoy, just like we like looking at period dramas about set around the Middle Ages or British royalty and the Henry VIII, is, is it going to be a, a, a nostalgic thing to watch a movie with a car chase? Um, probably. I would think so. Well, maybe it'll be the, uh, there's a joke that you know every British actor know, needs to know how to ride a horse and every American actor needs to know how to look, look like he can shoot. Um, so maybe they will, in the future every actor will need to look like pretend to, to know how to drive a car. Because <laughs> no one will actually know, but there will be all these actors who are kind of waving the steering wheel as though they know what they're doing. Yeah, it's like smoking in a movie, right? Exactly. But so often a character takes out a cigarette and I'm thinking, well, I wonder where they put that. Oh, it's supposed to show that he's – or she's cool or you know has this – savoir faire about them but yeah it'll be the same thing it used to be of course it used to be you drive a stick shift and that would show that you were a, a person of the world now uh, maybe it'll just be that you know how to start the car <laughs> well yeah so, so we'll talk that scene in that um star trek movie where the engineer is showing a mac and he and he talks to it and they and they, they say no 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 here you have to use the mouse and he picks up the mouse and speaks into the mouse <laughs> um, <laughs> It'll be the same thing. Oh, people getting into um, people get into a car and stare at the steering wheel and just say, "Hey, car, take me to work." And the car doesn't do anything. Yeah. Um, well, we're almost out of time. I want to close with an observation that you close your piece with, which uh, another thing I hadn't thought about. And I will, of course, put a link up to the piece. Um, it's really a thoughtful exploration of these issues, uh, which is the fact that these driverless cars, are, autonomous cars, are driving around with cameras. 24-7. And so we're going to yes. have a video footage of the world, uh, the urban world for sure, available to law enforcement, to the government, to the NSA, to you name it. And we think about – I remember you know, the tragedy of the Boston Marathon bombing, uh, how much footage was available for people to pour through and pour over that was publicly available and a lot of – Really clever speculation was done, and it turned out to be totally wrong. I thought, I thought the wisdom of crowds was going to solve the problem because people had stitched together so many uh, Flickr photographs and so many public available ones. But the law enforcement people had, of course, some access to other stuff that the public didn't, and it was very powerful. And I'm glad they caught uh, the people, and they appear to have caught the right people. But uh, there's going to be some serious privacy issues with driverless cars because they're running video t all the time. Yeah, so every, 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 every autonomous car is capturing high-definition, 360-degree 3D video all the time. Now, where it keeps that and where it puts it is a slightly different question. Um, it's actually quite problematic to store all of that data from every car, like – there's actually a question of where you physically put it. Do we actually even have enough? Actually, having enough storage to store all of it from every car would be might be cost prohibitive for a while. Um, but yes, you know, the uh, somebody's been killed, and the cops say they don't just pull the footage of all the cars in the neighbourhood. They say, did any car see anything strange? Yeah, yeah. Round up the usual suspects will be to round. You'll round up the cars first. Well, yeah, but, did any, it, but it's not just get me the raw video and I will watch it. It's did any car see anything unusual? Right. So, um, I mean, I sort of, you know, sort of, you can't do the time, but um, there was a murder in Britain sort of 15 years ago where the police got the CCTV from the buses that were driving down a road nearby, and the bus camera was just on the inside of the bus. Um, but you could just see out of one window, like, first bus, second bus, third bus. The second bus is a white van by the side of the road, and then the first and third bus, it's not there. So there you know you're looking for a white van. And that was kind of the break in the case. Well, you know, those buses will have 360-degree video now. 
It won't be the white van. It will be the license plate and the model and the guy standing next to it. Who will be identified immediately by... Yes, yeah, and it will, were yeah. there any sex offenders in the area? Yeah. Because you'll have that. You'll have all of that, all of the, all of the um, images of all the faces. And I just want to, you know, I, I just want to emphasize, the older you are, the weirder and creepier and and alien a lot of this seems of a world of surveillance, a world of cameras, a world of autonomous cars, a world where your phone does blah, blah, blah. Younger people are going to just find this normal and it'll be the way that they are used to things. And culture, I assume, will evolve to accept most of this. Um, you know, just the the, the thrill of going shopping. Uh, we talked earlier. I like. I happen to like going to the grocery store. I don't go so often, but when I do go, I enjoy it. And um, that fun's going to go away, I suspect, if delivery becomes cheap enough. And all these things are going to cause cultural changes that we can't imagine. Well, well, uh, the changes that we can't imagine. And it, the funny thing about this stuff is we actually can't imagine the changes that have happened because we don't have the perspective on what it was before. Yeah. So, so to give an example, like if you were a wanted man in a provincial town in Europe in like 1890, the police, all the police had to do was put like one guy on each of the three roads out of town and that was it. And they put a guy on the, at the train station. Yeah. And that was it. Like you couldn't get onto the train station. So what are you going to do? <laughs> You're stuck in the town. You can't go anywhere. Um, and then cars come along and suddenly people can escape and people can, you know, they kind of, they do, that degree of control just disappeared completely. Um, there's a thing from the early, 19, early 20th century called the Bonnard Gang in, Paris, in France who were a gang of anarchist terrorists who stole cars and stole rifles and went around killing people and shooting policemen. The police had no vehicles. The police had nothing, could struggle to work out what to do about this because they were stealing cars and could travel along at 50 miles an hour. Um, so there will be sort of, and that's of course now that that's kind of, but that that at the time that like the police could catch someone by just checking the railway station, you know, it's just kind of unimaginable now. But that was kind of that was the way the world was. And now they can, and now they can check everything almost, exactly, and they will but, be able to. You know, to. again, we'll get other kinds of freedom and other kinds of restriction on freedom. Yeah. My guest today has been Benedict Evans. Benedict, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.